Hello, this is Ken Shank, and this is my weekly podcast that I call Through the Bible in 10 Years. Today we're in Acts chapter 18. We're not going to do the whole chapter of Acts 18 today. We're going to do, oh, about two thirds of the chapter. In fact, if I were the one doing the chapter divisions, I'd have put the chapter division about where we'll stop today. Acts 18 uh, brings Paul to, to Corinth from Athens. Let me go ahead and read the first verse. After these things, having departed from Athens, he came to Corinth. So Paul comes to Corinth in Acts 18, and most of the chapter will be Paul at Corinth. Paul manages to stay at Corinth for at least a year and a half to two years. That's really good for Paul. He's getting better about ticking people off, maybe. But um, he has seems to be able to found a church at Corinth that is a little bit more sturdy or at least that's not the way to put it. He gets to stay longer in the formation of the church, um, and presumably he's he's learning how how to engage the culture in a way that doesn't get him kicked out of town as quickly. That's my my hypothesis, at least. So in the chapter Acts eighteen, it both ends Paul's what we call Paul's second missionary journey, and begins what we call Paul's third missionary journey. Now, um, these, it's conventional to speak of Paul's three missionary journeys. Now, we know from his own writings that he went to places that the book of Acts doesn't tell us about. In Romans, he talks about having gone as far west as Illyricum. Well, the book of Acts doesn't say anything about Paul going to Illyricum. And there's nothing wrong with this. Luke is selective in what he tells about Paul. Um, in order to create a tidy, narrative of Paul, Luke leaves out some things. And this is perfectly acceptable within ancient history writing. And so we have to reckon, as I've said before, that if we had other versions of Acts, if we had a Matthean version, if we had a Markan version, if we had a Johannine version of Acts, that there would be tensions between what Acts says and what those other um, histories would say. And we'd have to negotiate in the same way that we no negotiate between the uh, perspectives of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so I, I continue to use the conventional language of Paul's three missionary journeys, knowing that it was probably messier uh, than that, uh, but, but it does fine um, with our purposes. And, and frankly, we don't have enough information to speculate too much about what his other journeys might be, although I've done it. Right, I speculated that that Paul might have done uh, some travel work in Cappadocia and so forth before he even started his uh, so-called missionary journeys. Well, um, we're going to take, Lord willing, a, about an eight-week detour in the middle of this chapter. So while Paul was at Corinth, he wrote First Thessalonians, probably Second Thessalonians. We'll talk about some of the debates around Second Thessalonians when we get there. But um, when we finish Paul's time at Corinth today. Next week, we'll go to 1 Thessalonians 1 and talk about um, the letter that Paul wrote probably to Thessalonica. Well, to Th we know it's to Thessalonica, but probably from Corinth. And uh, Paul did not get to stay very long at Thessalonica, if you remember. We might say, it, it sounds like he was only there maybe two or three weeks uh, from the book of Acts, but we know from Philippians that the, the church at Philippi sent him a care package at least twice. And so we might say that Paul was probably at Thessalonica about two months, not very long, not long enough to really give them a full uh, discipleship uh, training in the, the fundamentals of faith. Um, the Thessalonian church, Thessalonian church was primarily Gentile, so they did not have a Jewish uh, base uh, from which to uh, supplement with specifically Christian understandings within Judaism. And so um, as we're going to find out, Thessalonians didn't quite understand how the resurrection worked. Paul must not have gotten very far into resurrection teaching uh, when he was there. And so Paul writes 1 Thessalonians as, as a kind of uh, filling in the gaps. Uh, and again, remember, Paul's letters are substitutes for his visits. He covered the basics when he was in person. And so we're getting the cleanup in his, his letters, which is kind of uh, depressing in a way to think of all of the fundamentals that, um, that we, we would like to know what he preached when he 
first came to a place. Of course, we do have Romans, which is a little bit of a, of a systematic presentation of at least one aspect of his thinking and theology. But um, so we're going to take a slight diversion into the Thessalonian letters after we finish today's uh, podcast. This might be a good place for me to mention a theory that I find problematic, but you may have heard. There's a theory that says that Paul was all smart and academic at uh, Athens, and it was a failure. And so he decided that when he got to Corinth, he was going to preach Christ crucified and not talk um, in human wisdom. Well, there's no strong evidence for this. For one thing, the book of 1 Corinthians doesn't say, I was such a failure when I tried to talk intellectual at Athens that I decided I was just going to preach Christ crucified when I got to Corinth. 1 Corinthians doesn't say that. He tells them he decided to preach Christ crucified with them. As a matter of fact, I would say that the book of Acts is very positive toward Paul's sermon at Athens. I think, personally, that Luke wanted Theophilus to know that Paul could play intellectual ball, uh, that, that uh, the sermon that Paul gives at Athens is a highly, what we might call, contextualized sermon. You preach a sermon that suits the audience that you're preaching to. And, of course, Paul's not exactly preaching. He's defending himself at the Areopagus. It's a more of an intellectual uh, lecture in some respects. But it has, the, it has the elements of the gospel, right? It talks about the resurrection. And so um, I would say that what Acts is really telling us is that we should contextualize our message to fit um, the, the people that we're, we're presenting it to. Um, this is what God does when he becomes flesh. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. When God is speaking to us, he speaks so that we can understand. He doesn't try to, to, he doesn't say, well, if you can understand my lecture, maybe you can be saved. But if you're too stupid to understand my lecture, then that's too bad for you. That's not God's approach to revel, uh, revelation. There's an old country gospel song I remember hearing years and years ago. He came down to my level when I couldn't get up to his. <laughs> anyway, I grew up, my dad used to listen to a, a radio show on Saturday nights uh, at, out of Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church called God's Country. So I heard, I heard these songs uh, coming out of my dad's study on a Saturday night. But anyway, um, but it's good theology, right? God comes down to our level because we can't get up to his. He speaks our language. And so there's, there's absolutely nothing wrong uh, with Paul's sermon at Athens. Paul is meeting the Athenian philosophers where they're at. When in Rome, speak to the Romans. Um, and so uh, the book of Acts gives us no sense uh, that Paul, Paul's sermon at, at Athens was a failure. Um, if anything, the, the message is that it's hard sometimes for intellectuals to have faith. I mean, you might, you might draw that conclusion. I don't know, Acts doesn't say that, but you, you might draw the conclusion that sometimes intellectuals have a hard time coming to faith. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not arguing for that. I don't want to argue for that. But you might come up with that uh, conclusion from um, what happens at Athens. But I don't think there's any evidence that Acts would have us believe that Paul's form of sermon was a mistake. I just don't think there's any evidence for that at all. Um, in fact, uh, that whole theory uh, seems to fit pretty well with a certain strand of American anti-intellectualism uh, within uh, Christianity. Mark Knoll uh, wrote a book called The Scandal of the Evangelical Mind a couple decades ago. And the base, basic thesis of that book is, is that um, there is a, a certain hostility among a certain strand of Christianity's uh, toward, uh, toward the mind and toward true intellectual uh, pursuits. It kind of actually fits a broader American tendency, uh, broader American tendency to make fun of, of, of smart people. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. Uh, there are different kinds of smart. And so uh, I, don't, I don't mean to suggest that uh, people who go into academia, for example, it's not that they're smarter uh, than somebody who does something else. Um, but th there may be different kinds of smart. Um, sometimes, I mean, it's true, sometimes people who are more stereotypically intellectual can be 
quite dumb when it comes to practical things. I mean, the, there's some, I mean, that, that happens sometimes, but these are all prejudices, right? Um, and uh, why is it that in high school, uh, the nerds are picked on, uh, you know, uh, and so forth? What is it about American uh, culture that, that kind of looks suspiciously upon, upon people who are interested in, in intellectual things? Well, maybe it's always been that way. But uh, in any case, there is a strand of anti-intellectualism, certain penchant to believe conspiracy theories uh, within uh, some parts of, of Christianity. And the theory that Paul threw away all intellectual things when he came to Corinth, uh, simply that's not what, um, that's not what Acts uh, says. And, and Paul does say in 1 Corinthians that there is a wisdom, a spiritual wisdom, um, that can be had, a spiritual um, um, smartness, as it were. Well, okay, let's go ahead and, and dive into Acts 18. Verse 2, and having found a certain Jew, uh, Aquila by name, uh, by race uh, of Pontus, or by, by region, being from Pontus, a Pontician, I just made that up, um, who recently, having come from Italy, and Priscilla, his wife, uh, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, uh, Paul came to them. Okay, so we meet Priscilla and Aquila. This is one of the few places where Aquila is mentioned first. Um, Priscilla is, when, so when he introduces the couple, he mentions Aquila. But when he mentions spiritual things, he mentions Priscilla first most of the time. Um, we're going to see that. Um, it's going to be a few weeks now. Uh, it's going to be about nine weeks. But uh, we're going to see that when, when Aquila and Priscilla disciple Apollos at Ephesus, it's Priscilla and Aquila that disciple Apollos. She's mentioned first. Um, and so this is a husband-wife ministry team. But it seems to me that it is very striking that Priscilla is often mentioned first um, when it comes to ministry. Uh, and so um, I think this is, of course, a fairly strong argument that women were involved with the discipleship of men within Paul's churches. And um, we'll talk about that as we continue to make our journey through the New Testament. They have recently come from Rome. So they are from Italy. Um, in fact, um, in Hebrews 13, where it says, those from Italy greet you. It's very tempting, can't prove it, but it's very tempting to think that the author of Hebrews is talking about Priscilla and Aquila, those from Italy. Could be wrong. And by the way, it says, having come from Italy, that's, that doesn't prove anything. But what, they've come because the Emperor Claudius has expelled the Jews from Rome. Now, I personally suspect that it's the Jewish Christians, primarily, uh, maybe not entirely, but but that the expulsion of Jews from Rome was probably primarily Christian Jews. Um, we have some evidence from the Roman historian Suetonius uh, that Claudius expelled these Jews from Rome because of arguments over Christus. Now, Suetonius mis misspells Christ if he's talking about Christ, but I would say the majority Given, given the correlation between this statement here and Suetonius's statement about Claudius, um, I think probably most historians would say that probably, let me give you a reconstruction here, that people like Priscilla and Aquila were Jews who believed that Jesus was the Messiah. And of course, this is going to come to Rome. There's, you know, everything flows to Rome. It's like it's a big city. People go there. And so, as the Christian movement grew, the movement, the, Christ, the Jesus movement, as it grew, it was inevitable that this would come to, to Rome. And so, long before, and of course, the, um, the, Roman, the, the Roman Catholic belief that Peter founded the church at Rome, that's probably not literally the case. Um, but uh, probably the truth behind that, I'm, I'm getting this from Meyer and Brown, um, they wrote a book called Antioch and Rome, Cradles of, of First Century Christianity, something like that. I like that book a lot. Um, that probably Roman Christianity had a Jerusalem flavor. Remember, Paul, Paul did not found the churches at Rome. 
and the church at Rome was there, or, or the, there were Christians at Rome before Paul even has begun his Corinthian ministry. And so it's inevitable that the, the flavor of Christianity at Rome would have been more like Jerusalem than like Paul. And I hesitate to use the word more conservative because what, what you mean when you say something's conservative depends on what you're conserving, right? But I would say that probably the Christianity at Rome was founded with a slightly more conservative Jewish flavor than Paul. That take Peter or James, the Christianity at, at Rome was probably more like Peter and James than it was like Paul. And so uh, I personally, uh, again, you can't prove these things. I think the book of Hebrews was probably written to the Roman church a, a few decades later here, a couple decades later. And so um, again, what is Hebrews addressing? The book of Hebrews is addressing a group of Christians uh, at Rome who um, don't quite see the full significance of Jesus' death. They're still thinking that, yes, Jesus died for our sins, but the temple in some way is still also part of the atonement equation. And of course, in the book of Acts, we're going to see even Paul offer a sacrifice at, Rome, at, at Jerusalem a little bit later on, I think around chapter uh, 21, Paul's going to offer a sacrifice. And so it was not entirely clear, I would argue, to the earliest Christians that the temple no longer had any sacrificial function. That's, a, that's an aha moment that takes a little time to percolate, percolate in the early Christian mind. And so um, the church at Rome was probably a little bit more Petrine in flavor. And I, there's an, a later statement by, uh, I think it's Ambrosi Astor, a church father, I think in the 200s, uh, who basically says that... Um, Roman Christianity did have more of a Jewish flavor. Of course, it's all Jewish. I think what he means is a more kind of Jerusalem flavor. So um, that's a little bit of a tangent, but I believe the church at Rome was already founded. That is, there were already believers, uh, and they would have been mostly within the synagogues, right? Um, it's because Christianity is a Jewish movement. And so it's inevitable that there would have been serious debates taking place among the synagogues of Rome. We can see, uh, and apparently, these arguments over Christ, Christus, these arguments over Christ must have been so disruptive at Rome that it even reached to the level of the emperor's attention. Massive conflict, and basically, the Romans did not like any kind of conflict of this sort. They were highly, they watched the temperature for riots and disunity and that sort of thing. You, you weren't even allowed to, to have kind of sectarian meetings, you know, and things like that. And so it makes perfect sense uh, that Claudius would say, I can't have this going on in the city. Um, and that he expels the most divisive uh, figures uh, out of the city. And by the way, in my mind, this means that Roman Christianity um, from this point on, about the year 49, becomes a primarily Gentile uh, movement. Because the, the Jewish Christians have largely been expelled from the city, it must have been a primarily Gentile church uh, from this point for, for a bit going forward. And so for this reason, I also believe that the book of Romans probably addresses a primarily Gentile uh, audience rather than a primarily Jewish audience. Well, some little side side notes there. But so Priscilla and Aquila come from Rome because they've been kicked out of the city by Claudius because they believe in Christ. And they come from, from Rome uh, to Corinth, and they get there about the same time that Paul gets there around the year 50. And so um, this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Uh, verse 3, and due to being of the same trade, of similar trade, Paul stayed with them and he worked, for they were also tent makers by trade. Now, again, Paul has a number of ways into a city. On the one hand, he goes to the synagogues when he first gets there, but he also has his business. Now, I think, I think probably back home, Paul was more like the owner of the company. Uh, Paul, if he, has a, if he has Roman citizenship by birth, 
then then he's he's of some means. And of course, he's an educated guy. He's very literate, which puts him in the upper crust of that culture. And so I, I and Paul Paul says something in I think it's First Corinthians four about how he worked with his hands. I've, I've worked with my hands. Um, and so I think probably Paul was more the 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 owner family back at Tarsus rather than the actual tent maker. But he humbles himself, you know, uh, quote unquote, um, down to to work with his hands, and he finds this as a way of uh, spreading the gospel. He, he can make tents while he shares the gospel with you, and he has a marketplace ministry. And this is, of course, we have the word tent maker here, and Priscilla and Aquila were also uh, tent makers. And so there would have been a tent maker guild within a city. And this is a place for Paul to set up shop whenever he goes somewhere. If he doesn't find a welcome ear at the uh, synagogue in the Jewish community, he could, he could always reach out to the tent making uh, community. And so Priscilla and Aquila and Paul, they're all tent makers and um, they're going to be the best of friends. Okay, so verse four, and he was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath, persuading uh, both Jews and, and Greeks. Um, so he's doing the same thing he's been doing all along. Now, when uh, Silas and Timothy uh, came down from Macedonia, remember they had been at Berea um, in the book of Acts, um, but we know that Timothy is sent back. Timothy is going to be sent back uh, from Athens to Thessalonica. Uh, we're going to see next week when we get into first. So there's a slight discrepancy here that I'm not 100% sure what to do. I, I tend to follow Paul over Acts when there's a tension uh, because Paul is, is the actual participant. He's a, he's a primary source. Acts is a, way, a, secondary, a secondary source. It's only a slight tension here. Uh, but uh, Silas seems to have gone on with Paul uh, from Athens to Corinth, and Timothy gone back to Thessalonica um, from Athens. But anyway, um, so Paul uh, was occupied when they, when they arrive here in Acts. Uh, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying thoroughly to the Jews that, that Jesus is the Christ. Verse 6, and opposing them, and them opposing and blaspheming, uh, having shaken out the garments, he said to them, your blood be on your head. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Now, this doesn't mean that Paul stops going to Jews. Uh, he does go to Jews. Uh, you know, can, that's his pattern. But he basically, he gave it a shot. He, he did his best. And, and the synagogue seems to have largely rejected him. So Paul seems to be persona non grata here. Uh, with the Corinthian synagogue. Um, and so he's going to focus on a Gentile ministry uh, now. Verse 7, and having departed from there, uh, he came into the house of a certain person, Titius Justus by name, who was worshiping God. So this is a God-fearer uh, whose house was adjoining to the synagogue. Now, uh, I wonder if this uh, Titius Justus is... Um, has another name. Uh, Romans often had uh, three names. And so I wonder if Gaius, if this is Gaius. We're going to see Gaius in uh, the book of Acts. Uh, I mean, sorry, in 1 Corinthians, we're going to see Gaius in Romans 16. Uh, Paul stays in the house of Gaius uh, while he's uh, visiting Corinth. Must have been a fairly large house. Uh, must have... Um, had quite a bit of space in it, I would think. This seems to be a rich person. He's a Roman citizen. And his house is adjoining the synagogue. So he, he was probably a God-fearer, somebody who worshiped in the synagogue. Verse eight, and Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all of his house. Um, we're gonna see Crispus also in the book of 1 Corinthians. Paul baptizes Crispus and Gaius. Um, uh, some of the first ones that he, he baptizes. Uh, so we're going to see Crispus again when we get to 1 Corinthians. And he believes, and all of those of the Corinthians that we're hearing believed and were baptized. Verse 9. And 
The Lord said in the night in a vision to Paul, do not fear, but continue speaking and do not be silent uh, because I am with you and no one will put a hand on you in order to harm you uh, because there are many of my people in the city. And I think what he means is that there are lots of people in Corinth who will come to faith. They haven't come to faith yet, but the Lord knows that they're going to come to faith. And so verse 11, um, and he sat, uh, he remained there for a year and six months. I think two years is mentioned um, somewhere else, maybe. Well, let's round it up to two. Uh, teaching, and it, maybe he did some side trips while he's there too. So I wonder if it was, was it now that he went to Illyricum in Northwest Greece? Um, it's hard for me to see Paul as just staying in Corinth and not doing some trips to the surrounding uh, region in order to Although he is focused on the cities. Paul's a city boy. We'll see this when we get to 1 Corinthians 9. He is not a country boy. He is not, he's, he doesn't have any interest in cows. Um, and he, it's hard for him to imagine that God would care about oxen uh, And when we get to 1 Corinthians 9. He's a city boy. Um, so I don't think that Paul spent a lot of time out in the country. Uh, but but it, I also wonder if during this uh, teaching among them the word of the Lord, the word of, of God, uh, in verse 11, I wonder uh, that if he, he did a, some tr side trips, shall we say, while he was at, at Corinth. So it's, it's, um, it's during this time that, that Paul will write first and, and probably second Thessalonians. But I'm not going to stop uh, here, although this would be a fine place uh, uh, to stop and do first second Thessalonians. I want to go ahead and finish uh, Paul's time at Corinth. Um, and with verse 12. Now, uh, Gallio being the proconsul uh, in place of the consul, the consul's in Rome, so this is a person who's in place of the consul. Uh, Gallio being the proconsul of Achaia, um, uh, they rose up, that is, the Jews rose up with one accord against Paul, um, and they led him to the Bema. Um, you can see pictures of, of this, the remnants of this Bema or you can go to Corinth and you can still see the, the remnants of the Bema. Uh, the Bema was in the marketplace, I believe, uh, and it was where legal type things were, where the, the proconsul would sit in, in, in judgment of uh, civil affairs of the city. And so Paul is brought before the Bema. By the way, um, the book of First Clement, uh, was written, I mean, traditional dating of First Clement is in 96 or the, the, the late 100s. There's been a lot of, I mean, the late uh, first century. There's been a lot of debate about that date. And I'm not an expert on First Clement, but I do, know, I do know that there are a sizable number of scholars who question both whether it was written by Clement and whether it was written um, in 96. But um, we do have this writing called uh, First Clement. Uh, which talks about Paul having been jailed seven times. Now, we don't have seven times mentioned in the book of Acts. And so, you know, as I, as I, and of course, seven is a, is a, a number that is favored. So, you know, could, it, could tradition have rounded it up from six, you know, or rounded it down from eight. But as I've thought about, well, when did these, when did these seven, if, if, if he had that many, then he had to have more jailings than Acts tells us about. And I do think that Acts uh, doesn't, doesn't highlight conflict between Paul and Rome. And so I, sus I, have, a, I have a feeling that Paul probably spent a night or two in jail here. I'm not going to say for sure. I also have a feeling, and again, I realize that I'm, I'm reading between the lines in a way that you could say, well, you're being too speculative, Ken. Stick closer to what it, you know, to what it actually says. But I, I think uh, if, you know, I'm not, this is not the place, but if I were to compare, say, Luke 24 with Acts 1, I think I, think I can make a good argument that Luke summarizes things um, in a way that, that um, means that Luke just, Luke just isn't giving us a videotape of what happened. Um, and so I wonder if, uh, if this marks more or less the end of Paul's time at Corinth, that he, you know, fin finally uh, he gets into trouble. And um, he's maybe jailed. He appears before 
Gallio, and then he, he pretty much needs to leave the city. Um, again, I'm, I'm not going to say that's exactly the way it happened, but that makes a lot of sense uh, to me. So Paul is brought before the Bema of Gallio, um, and the, his opponents were saying, quote, contrary to the law, this guy persuades people to worship God. Again, we, we, we see here, I think, hints of a fundamental conflict. God is Caesar, not uh, God is king, not Caesar. Jesus is king, not Caesar. There is a fundamental sedition uh, to Christianity in the first century. Um, obviously, I do not believe that the earliest Christians were openly hostile to Caesar or the government. I, I think they were law-abiding citizens, as Acts portrays them. Um, but their theology was inherently seditious. I, I, I believe it was, because they believed that Jesus took priority over Caesar. Um, now, d no matter how a Roman official or Caesar might have thought that they were crazy, you, you think some dead guy who was crucified is king and not me? No matter how crazy someone might think that is, it is a seditious perspective. So, verse 14, Paul, being about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, if there were some unrighteousness or wicked uh, crime a bad deed, O Jews, uh, according to reason, I would have uh, persisted with you. However, verse 15, but if these are contentions of your own law and, and contentions about names uh, and, and concerning a word about names and about law, your own law, see to it yourself. Um, I am a judge of the, I'm not wanting to be a judge of these things. Uh, and he drove them from the Bema. So basically what, what we see here is Paul doesn't get a chance to give a sermon here. Uh, because Gallio more or less cuts him off and says, you guys are, I'm not interested in your Jewish debates. You know, go handle it yourself. Um, it's interesting here about names, um, like Jesus, maybe, uh, the name of Jesus, because Paul did things in the name of Jesus rather than the name of Caesar. I mean, maybe that's what what is implied here. And their own law. And of course, the Romans viewed Jewish uh, things like not eating pork is as peculiar and and uninteresting, more of a curiosity. When Philo, the Jew from Alexandria, Egypt, appeared before the Roman emperor uh, Caligula, all, all Caligula wanted to talk about is how weird your food rules are. Um, and so Gallio seems to take a similar kind of uh, tact here where he basically says, I'm not interested in Judaism. Handle this yourself. By the way, um, the the chronology of Paul's missionary journeys, even though you know, I'm kind of giving you a somewhat standard uh, chronology. Paul's first missionary journey from 46 to 48. Paul's conversion around 33. Um, uh, uh, Paul's second missionary journey from um, say 50 to 52. These are fairly standard dates that we're very comfortable with. There have been there are occasionally people who uh, want to completely uh, upend the, uh, the the missionary journey uh, chronology, but there is a fairly firm date of Paul's missionary journeys, and it has to do with Gallio, because we have evidence of when Gallio was at Corinth. And basically, Gallio was at Corinth from 50 to 51. And so this is like the bedrock of Pauline cr chronology, that we know that Paul was in Corinth in the year 50 to 51, uh, because that's when Gallio. And um, so we generally talk about Paul's second missionary journey, journey being 50 to 52 or 49 to 51, um, something, something like that because we know that Gallio was in Corinth around the year 51. So that's a fairly, uh, fairly firm bedrock for Pauline uh, chronology. 
Galio had proconsuls had a two year appointment, but uh, Galio apparently went, he only stayed at Corinth for the first year of his uh, two year appointment. Okay, well, they can't get them to do anything with Paul. And so having taken, everyone having taken hold of Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, they began to beat him before the judgment seat. Uh, but n nothing of these things was a matter, was important to Gallio. We hear about Sosthenes in 1 Corinthians, don't we? Uh, because 1 Corinthians says Paul and Sosthenes. So Sosthenes, again, notice that Sosthenes remains with the synagogue. He, he's even the synagogue ruler. But Sosthenes believes in Jesus. And so uh, you can, it seems like the leadership of the synagogue at Corinth became Christians, and that the tension is thus between um, the leadership of the synagogue and, and some Jews within uh, the synagogue uh, there at Corinth. And, and this might be part of why Paul can stay there longer, because the leadership of the synagogue is actually apparently on his side. Well, um, not a happy kind of end uh, to Paul's time there at Corinth. Well, let me go ahead and begin to read verse 18, and then I'm going to end uh, today. And we'll return to verse 18 in about uh, nine weeks. But verse 18 says, And Paul, uh, still having remained for, se for se several days, or, or a number of days, um, having um, departed from the brothers, he sailed away uh, to Syria and Priscilla and Aquila uh, with him having shaved his head at Cancrea, uh, for he had a vow. Now, Cancrea was the port city of Corinth, uh, I think about four miles to the south uh, east of Corinth. Um, there were two port cities uh, around Corinth. If you wanted to go east, you would go down to Cancrea. Um, and so he apparently shaves his head in relation to a vow he's taken. Um, and he, he probably wants to make it back to Jerusalem uh, for a particular festival, uh, would be my guess. Now, again, call me, call me um, skeptical, or it's not skeptical. That's not the right word. But I wonder, again, if Paul and Priscilla and Aquila more or less have to leave Corinth because of the controversy there. Now, Acts doesn't tell us that, so I would be reading things between the lines. But uh, it certainly fits with the general pattern of Paul's uh, ministry. Uh, and I do think, as I've said, that Acts tends to downplay Paul's tension with Roman and secular authorities. So for, for perhaps I'm wrong, but I wonder if Paul and Priscilla and Aquila more or less have to leave town um, uh, in the wake of this crisis with Gallio, but perhaps I'm wrong. Um, well, I want to leave it there. Uh, so next week we will move to First Thessalonians, because Paul probably wrote, almost certainly wrote, First Thessalonians from Corinth to Thessalonica about the year 50. Um, and so uh, we'll be back, Lord willing, next week with Through the Bible in 10 years. See you then.